So I call this the dark side of the universe. So mainly focus on dark energy, but we will also talk about dark matter. And um, in case you, you know, have been living in a cave in Afghanistan, uh, I put that first slide up there. This is an exciting time in cosmology. And uh, big ideas, so these deep connections between the quarks and the cosmos, and powerful instruments. Now, we've got three theorists here today, so we've been giving short shrift to the, the uh, plumbers, sorry, the, to the <laughs> experimentalists who are pushing things forward. Um, and some people have even gone out on a limb to call this a golden age in cosmology. Our advances in the understanding of the universe are really tremendous. And of course, when we have advances, then we ask really big questions. And so this morning you saw kind of the small questions. And so we're going to go for the big ones here in the afternoon. And um, so I thought I would just put this in a little bit of perspective. Um, so we now live in the 4% universe. Do you know what I mean by that? So, uh, uh, so the first two bullets I, I think you got this morning that, you know, we can trace the history of the universe from even before quark soup to the galaxies and stars that we see today. Uh, we have a universe, I saw this in Alan's slides, that's uncurved and so has the critical density and the omega parameter, so you heard about the omega parameter, and omega is equal to one. And then what I'm gonna focus on is this question of the composition of the universe. So, um, and that's where the 4% comes in. So the stuff that's made out of atoms is only 4%. Only 4%. And then we have the dark matter, which I'm going to talk about briefly, which we think is not atoms. And that's about 26%. And I'm looking at the math here to make sure the numbers add up to 100%. And then we have dark energy, that's about 70%. And I apologize. Um, we know the numbers pretty accurately, but I, I don't want to get hung up on did I get the point there right? And there was a nice book by a friend called The 4% Universe. And so I thought that was a good, but you know, um, oh, and then the universe is old. So we actually know the age of the universe and ah, I screwed up. Uh, this is slide is two weeks old and I forgot to add the extra two weeks on. <laughs> um, so there we are. Um, this is a remarkable universe. You heard, you know, that we have this idea of inflation and we even have some, uh, actually have a fair amount of evidence for it. And uh, so, and a lot of this universe, uh, a lot of the evidence for the ideas that we have come from analyzing the cosmic microwave background, which I think you heard about earlier today. And this is the new iconic map that replaces the one that you'd all seen before, the W map map. This is the Planck map. This is the, you look at this and you can tell if you're a cosmologist. If you are a cosmologist, your heart goes pitter patter when you see this. <laughs> if you're not a cosmologist, you say that just looks like noise, uh, which is actually what it is. <laughs> and uh, when you analyze this, when you, and I, th I think you saw this curve earlier, and I don't want to dwell on this curve, but when you analyze this and do a certain mathematical operation on it and measure the temperature differences between pot spots on the sky, you get a curve um, that looks like this. So you've, you saw this earlier. Uh, the blue are the data points, and the red is the curve from this theory that involves uh, inflation and dark matter and dark energy. And so what you're, what you're supposed to take from this is, this is a pretty believable model. There's some evidence. So uh, the plumbers made these measurements, uh, and the theorists made the red curve, and they agree. Um, but then I want to, I wanna, you know, uh, tell you where we are. We're at a very exciting point, because we have this wonderful theory that uh, you're hearing about today. And it rests on three pillars. Dark matter, you're going to hear about that today. Dark energy and inflation. And uh, of course, you haven't heard anything about inflation. Um, and so the interesting thing is, so those are the pillars that support this model. So we've got this wonderful idea. We even have some evidence for it. But we're kind of out there on a limb 
because they can't tell you what caused inflation. Um, dark matter. So I'm going to tell you about dark matter, and I'm going to tell you we have evidence for it, and then I'm going to tell you we don't know what it is. And, uh, which doesn't mean we won't find out. And then thirdly, uh, in the middle pillar there, is dark energy. And likewise. So this is an, a very exciting point in, in our time of study of cosmology, is that we, we can trace the history. And um, on the other hand, the story is not complete, and there will be some surprises. And so we don't know what the dark matter is. We don't know what the dark energy is. And there are a few little details on inflation. And so you've heard about the one pillar, very important pillar. I, I've gone out on, I, it's not going out on a limb. Um, inflation is the most important idea in cosmology since the idea of the Big Bang itself. Re and, it, and it's probably even right. Um, <laughs> and dark matter and dark energy, those are the other two pieces the other two legs of the stool. And so that's what I want to uh, hit. And uh, I apologize for this. You know, so when we look at the universe, we only see the things that light up. And so that's Earth. Uh, just to bring you back down to Earth, that's Earth. And that's the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is the picture that you bought, $2 billion. Of course, in New York, $2 billion is not a big deal. That's a latte at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> But it was worth every penny of it. And this is the Hubble Deep Field. It's a tiny bit of the sky, one ten millionth of the sky, 1,000 galaxies. There's only one star in the picture right there. That's how small a portion of the sky is. And, um, but that's the 4%, actually. And not all the 4% light up. So you're only seeing a bit of the universe. Uh, you're seeing, as far as we can see, our technology, this is my one technology slide, takes us back. Uh, the limit of how far you can see is not the telescope. The limit is that as you look out in space, you look back in time. So you're looking back to when galaxies were born. Um, but you're missing most of the universe. You're missing most of the universe. And, uh, so I think in New York, they must tell you this. Uh, you know, your parents tell you, don't let the bright lights fool you, OK? It's the dark side. And so we're talking about the dark side. And just to do the numbers again, I'm going to keep doing the numbers. Stars are only a half a percent. And now you're going to say, but you said 4%. Atoms are 4%. Most of the atoms don't light up. Most of the atoms haven't made it into stars. And roughly speaking, the dark matter, and here's where the numbers, I do have a little challenge by arithmetic here. So the, the dark matter is about a third, and uh, the dark energy is about two thirds. And if there's something I want you to take away, there's a big difference between the two. Dark matter holds things together. Uh, it may be mysterious. It's the, it's the first, it's the warm up mystery. Dark energy is the one that knocks you out of your seat because it's pushing things apart. OK, so uh, dark matter is an old problem. It goes back to Fritz Zwicky sitting his, at his telescope here who was studying clusters of galaxies. That's the coma cluster of galaxies, several thousand galaxies all in one place. And uh, here, to give you a sense of clusters of galaxies, this is a big chunk of the sky, nothing like the Hubble Deep Field, much, much bigger. And so what, what uh, Zwicky and others noticed is that when you look at the sky, Sometimes you see a bunch of galaxies together, like here that says the Virgo cluster. So uh, mostly the galaxies are randomly distributed, but, but look at that big chunk. And then that one up there called A1656, that's the coma cluster. So you see collections of galaxies. And he studied them. And the galaxies are, are moving fast, thousands of kilometers per second. They're moving fast. And so the question is, so what keeps them together? And you know the answer, right? Gravity. Gravity is the cosmic glue. And he asked himself, OK, if I ask, is there enough gravity in all the stars, in all the galaxies, in this cluster to hold it together, does it work? And the answer is it misses by almost a factor of 100. And uh, so the gravity, that this just says that. The gravity of all the stars is not enough to hold the clusters together. And so Zwicky kind of went out on a limb 
He did the old Sherlock Holmes things. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, I wish I could remember that quote, <laughs> no matter how improbable. So he said, clusters must be held together by the gravity of unseen dark matter. So there's matter there that doesn't light up. And simple hypothesis, and that was 1933. And so why did it take so long to take him seriously? So there he is, <laughs> really, really smart guy. And if any of his relatives are here, I want them to note that I said he's a really smart guy. Uh, so smart that he was half as smart as he thought he was. And that's <laughs> devastatingly smart. And, uh, but, you know, I know you know this, and, you know, some of you have kids. And nowadays, what would happen is he gets sent home with a note pinned on, doesn't play well with others. And so not everyone paid attention to him, and cosmology was young. And so Vera Rubin, I hope that's a name you've heard of, Brought the, brought the puzzle closer to home, and she found exactly the same problem in galaxies, uh, in individual galaxies. Uh, and the story of Vera Rubin, um, I don't have time to tell it, but a, a pioneering woman in astronomy and made this important discovery. And how did she discover it? What did she discover? Same kind of thing. So here's a galaxy. This happens to be Andromeda. And in a galaxy, the stars move around the center of the galaxy. And what keeps them in their orbits? Gravity. And um, if the gravity were only the gravity of the stars, then the stars that are orbiting the galaxy that are f further out should be moving slower because you know that gravity, you've probably heard the inverse square law, I mean, gravity gets weaker. And, so what she measured is called a rotation curve. And what you can see, the, the thing that everyone in the room can see is the rotation curve is flat, that the stars farther away are moving just as fast. And so it can't be that all the mass is associated with the stars. And in fact, I'll just, I'm going to show you something that I'm embarrassed to show you. I'll, in fact, I'll blame it on one of my kids. Um, so the solar system is a system where all the mass is at the center. I mean, not 100% of it, but most of the math. And this is the rotation curve of the solar system, the speed with which the planets move. And you'll notice that uh, Mercury there is moving really fast because it's close. And Pluto, which isn't even a planet, <laughs> is moving slow because it's really far away. So um, that does not look like that. So there's something very different. And uh, what it is is that uh, galaxies like ours, um, there's the visible part of the galaxy, are immersed in a giant, we call it a halo of dark matter. And it's, it's not a halo like this kind of halo, but it's a kind of a spherical smear of, of dark matter. And so she brought the problem close to home. And since then, there's been an enormous amount of everywhere we look. And I don't want to dwell on all the evidence um, because science is faith-based. No, sorry, science <laughs> is evidence-based. So what is it? And so far, um, we've been able to say what it isn't. And um, so here's just a list you know, of uh, you know, black holes. So we're looking for stuff that doesn't give off light, or white dwarfs, or greenhouse gas. Well, I don't know how that one got in there. Uh, or dust. Uh, but I want you to focus on the bottom one. I, actually, I should have put on this list um, faint stars, you know, things that are just dim. Um, and all of these things have in common that they'd be hard to see. But nonetheless, we've been able to rule all of them out. In fact, let me just, let me just point to dust. How could we rule out the dark matter being dust? Well, that's really, really easy because if there were enough dust to be the dark matter in our galaxy, we couldn't see out of the galaxy. So that's the kind of logic that we use. Um, atoms. We can rule out atoms. How do we do that? Well, you saw that cosmic accounting earlier that came from the microwave background. And from the microwave background, we know how much matter there is. Um, and we know how many atoms there are. 
And this, this slide says it. The total amount of matter is about 30% of the critical density. Now, I know a lot of you have bad eyesight, and you think that says 33, but it says 30. <laughs> uh, and uh, the total amount of atoms is only 4%. And I bet there are people here who are good at math. So is there anyone here, I should ask someone to explain, is 4 equal to 30? No. Is 4 bigger than 30? No. So 4 is smaller than 30, so the total amount of mass, the total amount of matter is about 30% of the critical, and atoms can only account for 4%. So there's got to be something else. And the case is this simple. So we've worked ourselves into a corner, uh, being Sherlock Holmes, where this dark matter has to be a new form of matter. That's where we've worked ourselves through logic. Of course, in science, we now have to go out and demonstrate that. You can't just say, OK, we're done. Um, but that's the corner we worked ourselves in. So where did that matter come from? And it's particles that are left over from, from that early quark soup phase of the universe. And let me just walk you through the 13.8 billion, 13 billion years. We'll do it in real time, just for fun. <laughs> so um, this picture goes from the quark soup that Andre and uh, Alan gave us from the decay of the false vacuum energy and all of that. And then the universe is expanding and cooling and neutrons and protons form. And then the universe is a nuclear reactor when it's seconds old. And then atoms form. Uh, that's the light that we see from the microwave background and so on and so forth. And the uh, dark matter was formed during the quark soup phase. So what is it? Um, so uh, this is a slide that I drew in 1990, and the only reason I draw attention to that is that our focus has been pretty constant since then, that uh, we think it's a new form of matter, and what's interesting about it is that it's not matter that cosmologists invented. Uh, the new forms of matter were invented by particle physicists who were doing their job to try to unify the forces and particles of nature. So I'm going to point to um, the middle here, the neutralino uh, example. I'm going to use that as an example. So uh, Brian Greene is famous for his work on string theory. And I bet everyone knows, everyone's heard of string theory, right? Everyone's heard of Brian Greene. We'll start with an easy, <laughs> easy question. And uh, one of the hallmarks of string theory is something called supersymmetry. And supersymmetry says for every particle that we've already seen, there's a supersymmetric particle um, that has a different spin. And uh, I, don't, I don't want this to become a lecture on, on string theory, but it predicts that there are additional particles out there, they're heavier, and that uh, one of these additional particles lives a long time. Most of them just disintegrate. One of them lives a long time, and its name um, is the neutralino. So that's right in the middle of the moose here. And so when the cosmologists got a hold of the neutralino, they asked, well, gee, how many, would there, how many neutralinos in quark soup? That sounds like a good, you know, sounds like something you'd ask Julia Child, but uh, it's a good scientific question. And the answer is that the number that would remain from the quark soup would be about the right amount to give the dark matter. Um, so that makes it a very interesting candidate. The axion, I wish I had more time to wax poetic about the axion. Um, oh, let me finish up with the neutralino. So the neutralino, um, if it exists, has a mass of about maybe 100 or 300 times that of the proton. So it's pretty heavy, maybe even a little bit more. The axion has a much more interesting theory and a story. And the reason I put it here on the head of the moose is I call it the thinking man's dark matter. And uh, the axion, if it exists, uh, weighs a millionth of a millionth of what an electron does. So uh, much, much different. Very, very light. There'd have to be lots of them. And you, again, can calculate how many would be left over from the Big Bang. It would be about the right number. And the axion was invented uh, when I was a graduate student at Stanford, um, and my professor, Brian Green, no, I guess he wasn't a professor then, uh, 
uh, Roberto Pache and Helen Quinn invented this particle to solve a very subtle problem that involved how quarks interact. And uh, we have a very successful theory about quarks called quantum chromodynamics. And it has a tiny little problem. Actually, it turns out it's a very big problem. Um, and they solved it, but the solution involved creating a new particle. And that particle, there'd be a lot of them left over from the Big Bang, enough to be the dark matter. So we got the axion there. And then the legs, which are a little bit hard to see, this was made in 1990, they're labeled with the symbol for neutrinos. And in 1990, we know there are, we, the, the neutrino actually exists. So today, you know, you're going way, way out there. So at some point, you need to be grounded. So neutrinos are one of the things from today that we really know exists. And there are three kinds of them. And um, the issue with neutrinos is not whether or not they exist, but how much mass they have. We now know, in 1990, we didn't know this. We now know they have a tiny mass. In 1990, we were thinking maybe they have enough mass so that when you multiply by how many of them there are, that they uh, are the dark matter. And we now know that neutrinos don't account. They probably account for about as much matter as stars do. They're not the dark matter. So our two primary targets, there are some secondary targets, are the axions and the neutralinos. So that's where we are. We worked ourselves into, the, into this corner that the dark matter is a new form of matter. That's an unbelievably bold hypothesis. But it's not fact. How do we test it? And so we've spent a couple of decades building instruments to, tech, to, to test this. And I think this may be the decade of dark matter where we, res where, we, where we finish this puzzle. And we've got a land, sea, and air attack. And so let me just very briefly tell you what we're doing. So number one, you may have heard of this big accelerator. Oh, this is Fermilab, a dark matter factory. Um, so accelerators can change uh, energy for matter. And so particle accelerators, this is the Fermilab accelerator, which used to be the most powerful accelerator. We think of them as dark matter factories. Now it turns out, I recently heard, you know, who would have thunk? The Europeans built a bigger one. Uh, in fact, for a while, I, they said it was in Geneva. And I thought they meant Geneva, Illinois, but it's in the other Geneva. Um, and uh, so, you know, they, have the, they make these big collisions and big particle detectors. And I, wanted, I do want to get a t-shirt. And the t-shirt I want to get that says, they built a $20 billion accelerator and all they discovered is a Higgs boson. <laughs> what I want is the dark matter particle. So neutralinos are one of the targets. Uh, but wait, there's more. So if our galaxy is held together by neutralinos um, in a little bottle like this uh, with water in it, at any given time, there's one neutralino. So I can drink a neutralino. But these neutralinos are very, very shy. They're very, very shy. And so they, it, it, they're very hard to detect. So you need a big detector. You need to shield it from the radiation hitting the Earth. So it says Sudan mine. This is one of the most uh, sensitive dark matter searches. There are 10 or 20 of them around the world. And this is in a mine in uh, Sudan, Minnesota, underground to shield it from the cosmic rays. And so they are trying to detect the dark matter particles that hold our galaxy together. Um, and then there's a third approach. Uh, these dark matter particles can occasionally bump into one another. And the word we use is annihilate or transform into particles that are easier to detect. For example, let me give you the easiest, easiest one, a photon, a gamma ray, uh, or a positron. And uh, it actually turns out that dark matter neutrinos are easier to detect than dark matter particles. And so we have. Um, uh, let's see, so that's the uh, Fermi, uh, what's it called, Gamma Ray Space Telescope uh, is looking for gamma rays from dark matter annihilation. Uh, we have a couple of satellites looking for positrons. That one's called Pamela. Uh, the one below is an experiment on the International Space Station. And then the Ice Cube detector, which is a detector at the South Pole, is looking for neutrinos from 
dark matter annihilations in the sun. So we're, we're looking for, we're looking to verify this hypothesis in three different ways. So bottle them, that is make them, at, make them at an accelerator laboratory, detect the ones that are holding our galaxy together, or see them annihilate. And all three of these methods, I could, I could go on for another hour, but I'm not going to on these three methods, all of them have little signals. We call them anomalies. They, uh, things that are not consistent with any ordinary physics, but look like they're signaling that we found the dark matter. And so we're debating, you know, there's constant chatter about this. And um, so I think in the next 10 years, we may close out the dark matter puzzle, which is good, because then now that brings us to dark energy. So I now want to talk about uh, dark energy, the fact that the expansion of the universe is speeding up, not slowing down. And it's a puzzle that my colleagues accuse me of wandering around the halls of the University of Chicago saying dark matter is the most profound problem in all of science. And I'll, come, I'll, I'll end with that. Um, so you know the universe is expanding. And uh, Edwin Hubble uh, found the evidence for the expansion. Uh, and that galaxy in the middle is ours. And what he found in the 1920s is other galaxies are moving away from us. And the ones that are farther are moving faster. So the, uh, Einstein interpreted this uh, in an amazing way, which is the galaxies aren't moving. What's really happening is space is expanding, and the galaxies are being carried along. And space is expanding uniformly, and that's why the galaxies that are farther away look to be moving faster, because when you expand space uniformly, the galaxies that are farther away are being carried greater distances as the universe expands. OK, so you all know that. And let me just do, uh, this is the Harvard part of the talk. You know, are we at the center of the universe? You know. Um, well, at Harvard, everyone's at the center of their universe. And uh, so here's a universe. These are galaxies. And then through the miracle of PowerPoint, I can expand it. Does that look a little bigger? And then I can expand it again, and that looks a little bigger. And so we'll now address this question of, are we at the center of the universe? Hey, we should take a vote. That's how we do things in science is now. How many people think we're at the center of the universe? How many think we're not? OK, pretty evenly split. I guess we don't know the answer to that one. Um, so now let's look at what this looks like from uh, the perspective of different galaxies. So let's pick that one um, and then superimpose those three pictures. Uh, one, two, three. I've superimposed the three pictures. And remember, those three pictures are like three different times. And so what you can see is from the perspective of that galaxy there, it sees the other galaxies moving away from it. And if you look at the spatial relations here, the ones that are farther away are moving faster, right? They, in, 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 the, in, in the time between the three frames, they've gone farther. And so from the perspective of that galaxy, it, you know, it's a Harvard student. It's at the center of the universe. If we look at the perspective from another galaxy, say that one, and just take those, you know, the three different images and now line them up on that galaxy, bop, bop. After you get adjusted to it, remarkably, you see the same picture. Uh, it sees all the other galaxies moving away from it, and the ones that are further away look like they're covering more distance or moving faster. And you know, I last gave this talk in LA, so you know, in LA you have to do this a third time. <laughs> there, you know, so there you go. Okay, but you guys are New Yorkers, you're smart, you don't. Uh, and uh, so this Einstein's interpretation of this, that space is expanding uniformly in all directions, um, explains Hubble's data and says that everyone's at the center of the universe. Now, the one tricky thing here, before somebody tries to nail me with this, is that, of course, if you're near the edge here, you're going to ask, what about, the, you know, what about the edge? Well, I forgot to tell you that uh, I only showed you part of the universe, right? It's a, it goes on forever. 
And so because of this, so no center, different perspectives, because of this, we can describe the evolution of the universe. It's just a scaling up. It just scales up with time. And so this is how a cosmologist thinks about the evolution of the universe, is that the size increases with time. So those are those green curves. And time is this axis. And size is that axis. And it started out really small. That's what we call the Big Bang. And it, its size is increasing with time. And notice that, and I'm going to use a technical term. I apologize for using a technical term here, that the lines are droopy. So notice that the, the rate at which the universe is getting bigger is slowing. The lines are drooping. That's because gravity should be slowing the expansion, right? And so the big question up until about 20 years ago was, um, is there enough stuff in the universe to cause the universe to slow down, halt, so that's the bottom curve, and then fall back on itself? So a universe with lots of stuff, gravity would halt the expansion. It would re -eclapse. The upper curve is a universe with less stuff, and uh, gravity would not do that. Uh, it would eventually notice it goes to kind of a straight line there. It stops slowing down. And then there's Goldilocks in the middle, you know, slowing and slowing and slowing, and an infinite time after the Big Bang stops. And then there's a relationship between the amount of stuff in the universe and uh, uh, the shape of the universe. So a high density universe, the bottom one curves back on itself. And a low-density universe is curved like a potato chip. And Goldilocks is not curved at all. And so this is a slide. Probably it wasn't a slide, but I know you all learned this on your mother's knee. There are three kinds of universes, right? And uh, once we figure out the slowing of the universe, we will have figured out the destiny of the universe. This is what your mother told you. And so this has been a hot question in cosmology for a very long time. And how would you go about measuring the slowing? Uh, Alan talked about measuring the shape. So uh, a puzzle to think about here uh, will be, let's see, we're, we're the uncurved universe. So how does that work in these pictures? We'll come back to that at the very end. So I'm going to come back to this idea that the telescope is a time machine. And that's how we can measure the slowing. So this is, uh, this literally looks like Hubble's famous diagram, where he plotted velocity, apparent velocity of the galaxy against its distance. And what Hubble found was this straight line relationship between the two, that the galaxies that are further away are moving faster. And if we remember what Einstein told us, if we measured galaxy distances and apparent velocities today, I'm going to tell you in a second we can't do that. But if we did, we would get absolutely a straight line because the expansion of the universe is just a stretching of space. And so that's that straight line that's dotted. But we can't measure the velocities today because the telescope is a time machine. And when we look back at very distant galaxies, we're measuring their speeds way back when. So now this is going to be the hardest 30 seconds in the talk, so I want you to concentrate. So um, if we could measure the velocities today, we would get a straight line. Let's suppose the universe is slowing down. And now let's remember that we're actually measuring the velocities way back when. So if, the, if that broken line are the velocities today and the universe is slowing down, then way back when, the data points should fall above the, the straight line. They were moving faster. And so uh, what cosmologists have been trying to do for a very long time is look at the deviation of, they call it Hubble's law, from a straight line and measure that slight upward curvature. The reason it's hard to do is not just because they're not as smart as theorists, <laughs> although that's part of it. Now, don't tell them I said that. Uh, What's hard to do is getting the distances. It's hard to measure the distance to a galaxy. The velocities, I don't want to go into it, but it, um, we measure velocities the same way that a policeman uses. Of course, no one in New York drives a car, but uh, 
you've heard of cars, right? And, <laughs> and you know that they're radar guns, and you know they use the Doppler shift to measure the velocity. That's how we do galaxies. The distances, um, we basically need a standard candle. So the technique we use is called a standard candle. And you all know about standard candles. Oh, but you don't drive cars. Um, but you know, if you take a light bulb and you move it away from you, it gets fainter. And so if you had everyone, if every galaxy in the universe carried a light bulb, a standard light bulb, and then we were able to look at that standard light bulb, the faintness of that standard light bulb would just tell you how far away that galaxy is. So that's the, that's the theorist, you know. OK, so that's what a standard candle is. But of course, the universe is big, and it's hard to see distant galaxies. So how do we actually do it? Well, that's been a problem over the years, is, is uh, standard candles, is there aren't really good standard candles. A number of years ago, astronomers discovered a pretty good standard candle, and it's called a Type 1a supernova. Let me tell you what a Type 1a supernova is. It's a star that's about 40% bigger than our sun that undergoes a thermonuclear explosion and obliterates itself. And so uh, in, uh, it's a 1.4 solar mass thermonuclear bomb. So um, without going into the details, uh, that sounds pretty standard if it's, if it's a fixed size. And the nice thing about it is you can see them across the universe. So there's, up in the corner, there is a very distant galaxy. There's a type 1a supernova. It's as bright as the galaxy. And each one of those is the same. So they really, they're easy to see. There's only one catch. And the catch is that these supernova don't go off very often, about once in 100 years per galaxy. But I know you're all paying attention. The expansion of the universe is the same in all directions. So it doesn't matter what galaxy, which galaxy's distance you measure. Uh, they're all, they all fall on that Hubble line. Uh, and so you just have to study enough galaxies. And oh, I was going to tell you what. My colleagues at the University of Chicago do numerical sim. Isn't that beautiful? So it's actually a white dwarf star that's accreting material from a smaller star, and it eventually pushes it over and causes it to explode. And, and we think we even understand why they're standard candles. Um, so how do we do this? A key technological breakthrough, oh, here's my other technology bit, are big electronic cameras. Because you don't want to wait 100 years and stare at one galaxy. But if you stare at 100,000 galaxies, for example, then 1,000 of them will have a supernova in a year. So that's math I can do. And so, but how do you stare at a large number of galaxies? Well, you have a really big camera. And so that was the technological breakthrough, the same technological breakthrough that you have in your iPhone. Or, well, not all of you have iPhones. but uh, And so let me show you how it works. You take a picture. You take a picture of a big chunk of the sky where there's, let's say, 10,000 galaxies on, uh, let's pick a date, May 15th. And then you come back on May 30th, and you take a picture of that same sky. And then you subtract the two pictures and see if anything went bump in the night. And that's what was done here. So uh, the background uh, is a picture from a ground-based telescope of lots of galaxies. And see that little square that's blown up? Uh, so it's blown up so that you can see an image uh, of two galaxies next to one another. One is the before, and the other one is the after. And you'll notice that the galaxy in the upper left corner is, looks different. And when you subtract those two images, do you see the one that says difference? Uh, this one right here says difference. You see right there that something was different. There was a supernova in that galaxy. And now you, you uh, task the Hubble Space Telescope to go look at it. And that upper image is an a, a image from the Hubble Space Telescope. OK, and what do you find? Now we're back to cartoons. 
So those little blue things are the data. And oops, oh, I must have screwed this up, right? Because the data are not above the straight line. That would be a slowing universe. The data are below the straight line. And so in fact, after 80 some years of trying to measure the slowdown of the universe, it's actually speeding up. And so that was extraordinary. There were two teams involved. Uh, one led by Adam Rees and Brian Schmidt, and the other led by Saul Perlmutter. Uh, very competitive team. Science, science is a great human activity, and there's competition. And I can tell a little story about them. Uh, you would have thunk that the biggest surprise that they would have had when they made this discovery was that the universe was speeding up and not slowing down. That was not the biggest surprise. The biggest surprise to each of the teams was that they got the same answer of the other team, because <laughs> both teams thought the other teams were fools. <laughs> and this team was the physicist team, and these were the astronomers, and the astronomers thought, you know, these guys don't even know what a magnitude is, let alone a supernova. And so big, big discovery, cover of Science Magazine in 1998, and there's Carl Sagan reminding us that extraordinary results or no, what does it say? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So that was in 1998. And long story short, um, we now have the extraordinary, extraordinary evidence. The two teams collected about 50 supernovae each. Since then, we've got added another couple of thousand plus different lines of evidence. And in fact, uh, this again is the microwave background, uh, these curves. And uh, if you remember uh, Alan Goose omega parameter, the total amount of stuff is the critical density. Matter is only about 30% of that. There's, this whole story only works if there's something else out there, like dark energy. So this is an indirect method, but we now have the uh, extraordinary evidence. So uh, the universe, the, uh, if Carl Sagan were still around, I think he would, you know, I don't know if he would do two thumbs up or one thumb up. The, the universe really is speeding up. Now actually, oh, and most importantly, this was certified by Sweden. <laughs> so in 2011, Stockholm certified this by giving the Nobel Prize to Adam, Brian, and Saul for this uh, remarkable discovery. And if you come back to this morning, to the boring part of today, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, oh. A little choke collar just went off there. <laughs> they gave Andre the controls on it now. Um, this, this, this discovery was really important to those of us who, in their other life, study inflation, because inflation went out way on a limb saying, I mean, saying that the universe has the critical density. And Alan Guth told you this morning that, you know, towards the end of the 90s, it was looking like we were coming up a factor of three short. And all of a sudden, this, this rescued inflation. So this was a really big deal. Um, but we have a higher standard. Theorists have a higher standard. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, one of the great astrophysicists of, of the 20th century, um, put it uh, Put it this way, no experimental results should be accepted until confirmed by theory. <laughs> and, oh, this is a smart group. If you, if you have a mixed group of theorists and experimentalists, you have a bimodal laugh. The theorists laugh immediately, they get it. And then there's kind of a tale a little bit later from the experimentalists. <laughs> and of course, all I'm saying is that science is not just a notebook of facts. It's understanding about nature. And so, um, that's all that says, uh, that if, if we can't understand some of the facts that we gather, they may be too good to be true. And this is one of the key points in, in uh, uh, today's talk, is that repulsive feature, sorry, repulsive gravity is a feature of Einstein's theory, even if he didn't know it. Okay. And that sounds like the world's biggest oxymoron because the word gravity, I mean, it's, you know, it means heavy. It means, you know, being pulled to the earth. It, you know, uh, 
so what is repulsive gravity? So gravity uh, not only can pull things together, that's how we think of it, it's attractive, that's its defining feature, um, but really weird stuff, oops, we'll get to the really weird stuff, uh, can have repulsive gravity, and that's called dark energy. And I'll tell you why I called it dark energy in a second. But let's talk about that just a little bit. And actually, Alan Guth, I know, touched upon this this morning. Um, and that is an amazing feature of, of general relativity is that what causes gravity, or what the word we use is sources gravity, is, just not, is not just matter or energy, but it also depends on what the stuff is made of. In fact, let me just go to this slide um, that, and remind you about Newtonian gravity. So remember when you learned about Newtonian gravity. The force of gravity that an object exerts only depends upon its mass. And you all know that. And, and you know it so well that you probably don't think it's remarkable. I mean, probably you didn't have a teacher who said, that is the most amazing thing. I imagine it doesn't matter if it's a block of lead or a ball of gas. The, it, the, the force, the gravitational force it exerts only depends upon its mass. I mean, that's really remarkable. And that's true in Newton's theory. In Einstein's theory, um, if you think about gravity instead of being a bending of space a, a, as a push or a pull, uh, the strength of gravity also depends upon the composition. So that's built into his theory. And um, Alan, sh I'll, sh I'll, show I'll write this two different ways. So what I've written here is that the strength depends upon the amount of mass or energy plus three times the pressure. So the, the surrogate for what it's made out of is the, is the pressure. And so what that means, for example, so what's something that has a lot of pressure, a hot ball of gas, like the sun? So if you take an object with the mass of the sun that's cold, and you take the sun, which is hot, and they both have the same mass, the gravitational field of the sun will be slightly stronger. Now, it's a very, very tiny effect for, for ordinary stuff. It would only be a, uh, larger by about a part in a million. So let's go back. So this is the formula that Alan showed you, is what sources gravity is rho, mass or energy density, plus three times the pressure. Now, mass or energy density, I don't want to get, actually, uh, I don't want to get into a big discussion of that. We don't like the idea that it would be negative, OK? But pressure, what would negative pressure mean? Negative pressure, so pressure is an outward push. Negative pressure is how we describe something that's elastic, like a rubber band or a rubber sheet. So having negative pressure is no big deal. I mean, it just means that something is elastic. So if you look at this formula, rho plus 3p, so if you had something whose pressure is negative and, and more negative than a third of its energy density, then its gravity would be repulsive. Now, Alan, I did a cheat here that Alan didn't do this morning. Is there some speed of light squared here that I didn't put in, that Alan put in this morning? So things, the sun, the pressure of the sun compared to its energy density, the pressure is a million times smaller. If you look at a rubber band, I don't even know how much smaller the, you know, the, the, uh, the P is, but it's billions. So something whose pressure is comparable to its energy density is really weird. I mean, it's unusual. I'll give you an example. The simplest example uh, is the cosmological constant or vacuum energy, and so I'll do that. And for that, p is equal to minus rho. And if p is equal to minus rho, then rho plus 3p is equal to minus 2 rho. So that's really, really repulsive. So right in Einstein's theory is the prediction that gravity can be repulsive. So the definition of dark energy is stuff that's very, very elastic, so elastic that its pressure, uh, sorry, that, so its gravity is repulsive. And let's see, we did that slide. So now you're caught up with us. So accelerated expansion is caused by the repulsive uh, gravity of dark energy. Any questions? Do you all understand that? Well, of course you don't. We don't understand it. So what is this stuff? 
So, uh, oh, here's the naming. Let's take, a, let's take a brain break. To, so how did this dark energy name come about? So, uh, you know, in May 1998, I convened a focus group. And I said, we have this new thing in, in, in science, and, and we, you know, we don't want it to be scary, and let me tell you about it. And we're thinking about calling it funny energy. And they said, that's really great. You know, that's really great, because that's not off-putting, and it's not scary. And, it, and, and so, so there's the slide. This slide actually appeared in the New York Times. Funny energy. And then I said, you know, but it's going to take a couple billion dollars to understand it. And they said, oh, you need a more serious name than that. <laughs> um, so first example of, uh, of what dark energy could be. Um, and this is the Zen part of the talk. So it's the energy of nothing. So what is nothing? Nothing is something. OK, are you with me on this one here? Nothing is something. So according to quantum mechanics, nothing is filled with particles living on borrowed energy and borrowed time, kind of like New Yorkers. Uh, and uh, at least that's what I heard. Uh, and so th these are the virtual particles of the quantum vacuum. We know they're there because Willis Lamb did experiments at Columbia University in 1948 and detected their effect on hydrogen atoms and got the 1955 Nobel Prize. And uh, I, bet you'll believe, I bet you won't ask for proof of this. Um, if the energy associated with these virtual particles, if there is an energy associated with these virtual particles, I can prove that the pressure is exactly equal to minus the energy density. OK, so it has repulsive gravity. So we've reduced this to calculating how much nothing weighs. So here we put the theorists on the spot. The theorists have to tell you how much nothing weighs. And so we've calculated it, and we've almost got the right answer. Well, we're off by 10 to the 55. Good enough for government work. Actually, um, this is where we really, you know, you see us turn into a puddle of uh, whatever, goo. Um, because the way I like to defend us is to say that actually the answer we get is infinity, and infinity is, an an is not a number, and therefore our answer is not wrong, <laughs> because we haven't gotten an answer. Did you fall for that one? So it's better not to get an answer than to get a wrong answer. But you got the idea that when we try to calculate, so it's perfect. It has repulsive gravity. Uh, we just can't calculate how much there is, and um, so this is in science. Uh, oh, yeah, I already said that. Uh, I already told you about them. Oh, 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 hang on. I, w I wanted to show this again. So two things I want to say here. Number one, this vacuum energy, this thing we call vacuum energy, I'll show you this picture, um, is mathematically equivalent to what Einstein called the cosmological constant. Um, except now, he didn't understand why he put it in his equations. He put it in his equations to get a universe that didn't expand. Um, this energy of the vacuum, in principle, is there because the vacuum is filled with these virtual particles. OK. Um, so, well, let's just see. Let's just suppose we got the right answer. Uh, does everything hang together? And that's what this picture shows. So this axis here is omega matter, how much matter there is. This is how much vacuum energy or lambda there is. These are all the measurements. And all you really need to look at is the bullseye there at the middle. This works really good. And as my wife would say, you meant to say well. Yeah, it works well, too. Um, and so that's the number you would get. You would get about 73%. And so why don't I end right here and say, you know, it's just the energy of the vacuum. Uh, you know, one of these, guys, one of these days you'll, you'll get it. And uh, so let's see. So it's lambda. We, we have testimony that you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck. Tell the court, are you a duck? So that's the way we think about it. So why aren't we satisfied? Well, we don't have a good theoretical understanding of it. So this might work, but, um, and in fact, What's lovely about this, and this is what's lovely about science, is you start with one puzzle. And once you start working on one puzzle, 
It's like the Andromeda strain. It becomes two puzzles, right? So now we have two puzzles. Why does nothing weigh so little? And by the way, you know, I don't want to forget about dark energy. And it could be that nothing weighs just the right amount and is the dark energy, or it could be that nothing weighs nothing, and if it does, we're going to call that Turner's theorem. And then what, what is the dark energy? Do you see the... So here's the most fun part. This is what gets theorists up in the morning, is when we have really, really big puzzles, like why the universe is accelerating, we know that the answer to the riddle will, will require a crazy new idea. In fact, we, we often, uh, you know, when we're in the theory, theory locker room talking to one another, we often say, yeah, you know, Jeff, that's really good. That, that idea is almost crazy enough to be correct. And, oh, but there's a footnote here. Not every crazy idea is a solution to a profound problem. Most of them are just crazy, so we have to sort them out. Let me run through a bunch of crazy ideas. Um, so supersymmetry, we heard about that before. And uh, if the world were supersymmetric, you can prove that nothing would weigh nothing. You could prove Turner's theorem. Even Brian Greene could do that. Um, our world is not supersymmetric. So the super partners don't weigh the same as their counterparts. So if supersymmetry is a symmetry, it's what we call a broken symmetry. Oh, oh, this looks really, really good. So if, it, if we really were supersymmetric, we'd get zero but we're not quite supersymmetric, so we get a small number. Oh, this sounds great. Unfortunately, when you try to see this mathematically, uh, you don't really get a small number. You get the 10 to the 55 number. But maybe, you know, maybe there's a germ of an idea here. Here's another idea. I call this the most extravagant solution. Um, and this is the cosmic landscape of superstring theory. So in superstring theory, there are many, many solutions. And they all have different energies. And the energies differ by an enormous number, a really big number, 10 to the 122 bigger than what we need. But you get all kinds of different uh, uh, energy states for the universe. And you get, in fact, you get 10 to the 150, sorry, 10 to the 500, 10 to the 150, 10 to the 500, same difference. And one of them will have the right value. Let's see. So let me try to understand the solution. Let me try to be a little bit of a critic. So we had this problem. Uh, and the solution is to invite, invent 10 to the 500 other universes. And OK, well, maybe it's right. Um, and then this morning, you heard about inflation. Uh, and maybe this is just mini inflation. Because this kind of sounds like the same thing. Here's the picture that Alan Guth drew and Andre uh, drew this morning. And so we just draw a miniature version of this. We're going through mini inflation. So uh, if it happened once, it could happen another time. Oh, and then here's my son Joe. Uh, when he was six, and that was a long time ago, I said, Joe, you want to get in on the fun? I was trying to make a talk. We used to have transparencies. I said, draw me a picture of dark energy. And this is what he drew. And, oh, he was so cute then. There he is. And you know what? I, I still think this is true. His theory has at least as much truth as any of the others do. Uh, oh, and then here was my crazy idea. There is no dark energy. Um, we've just discovered a new aspect of gravity. And I can explain it in one line. An empty universe accelerates. You might say, well, we don't live in an empty universe. Well, actually, we do. It's been expanding a very long time. And if you compare the density of the universe today to, to the times when Andre and Alan were talking about it, it's 100 orders of magnitude smaller. Unfortunately, this is poetry. What is it? You write, you know, you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. And so this was a really good poetry. But trying to put a theory to this, actually, we do have a theory to this. Unfortunately, the theory did not explain the solar system as well. But that's a small detail. OK. Um, a big feature of, uh, of dark energy is it's this pressure. And so we, we honored our former president, uh, George W. Bush, with a parameter called W. And so that's pressure over energy density. 
And uh, that tells you how the dark energy changes with time. And so if the pressure is equal to minus the energy density, uh, so this is a plot, time goes this way and energy density goes that way, it doesn't change at all. If W differs from minus 1, then the dark energy can slowly increase or it can slowly decrease. And we'll come back to that. And what do we know about W? Uh, well, we know a lot about W. Somebody's going to write his biography, but this is the W I want you to know about. What's remarkable is the measurements that we've made so far say that it's remarkably close to minus 1, kind of minus 1 to 10 percent. So it kind of looks like the duck even though we don't want it to be the duck. So what do we know about it? Um, not much. It's smooth. It's very smooth. It's not particulate. That's really weird. So since the time of Democritus, you know, we break, we, everything's made of particles. This is not made of particles. Um, it ha it's, because P is close to rho, it's very, very relativistic. Uh, it has repulsive gravity. It's the energy of nothing. So far, it quacks like lambda. But we, uh, so the two big questions are, does it change with time? Uh, no, at the 10% level, but maybe if we look at it carefully. Uh, is, do we have to go beyond general? Just because general relativity can explain it, that doesn't mean that uh, it isn't pointing us to a new feature of gravity. And uh, about a year ago, the Dark Energy Survey, a big experimental program to study the uh, expansion of the universe, uh, went underway. There are going to be big telescopes in space. I put the Large Hadron Collider here because maybe they'll discover supersymmetry. We've identified all these pieces of the universe, these features of the universe. And uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what it all means. And trying to put it all together, construct the big picture. Uh, some of what we have is probably wrong. Uh, some of the ideas need to be reshaped. But we've got these really big ideas. And we, I, didn't, I apologize for not uh, you know, giving full credit. We also have powerful instruments that are going to help us. We can't do this by pure thought. That's not how science works. So uh, thank you very much for your attention.